This session gets on the conversation to discuss open innovation, different stages and choices of crowdfunding, especially from reward to equity base, changes in landscape of funding options, additional support opens to crowdsource, not just funding, but also talent, doing business with risk balance, choosing the right type of crowdfunding for growth and expansion. Our moderator for this panel is Kunik Pisolayabut. He is an investor and entrepreneur with over 20 years of experience. He plays active management roles in several ventures that he founded or co-founded. As a faculty member of Satsin Graduate Institute of Business Administration, Thailand, he coaches MBA students in their venture business planning and lectures in various subjects. Kunik also takes on advisory roles in various non-profit organizations. He co-founded and is the president of the Corporate Responsibility and Ethics Association for Thai Enterprise. Kunik was honored as a young global leader of the World Economic Forum in 2011. At the request of the BUFE, he also founded the Bangkok Hub for the BUFE's Global Shapers community in 2012. So without further ado, let us welcome Kunik Ka. Good afternoon. I hope you all had a, had a good lunch. Um, and I need to be joined by some panelists, right? Um, otherwise, it's going to be a very boring session. And uh, first, first of all, I'd like to invite up um, Mr. Carl Esposti, the CEO and founder of Mass Solutions and Crowdsourcing.org. Is Carl here? Can someone locate Carl? Oh, he's coming. He's coming. All right. Um, our second panelist, um, whilst we're waiting for Carl, is Kun Natawood, or Kun Mo, the CEO and founder of Okbi. We, we, we also have a couple of uh, surprise panelists that uh, were, were requested to, to join our group. Um, just over lunch, in fact, um, Mr. Andrew Dix, the CEO and co-founder of Crowdfund Insider, please. <laughs> Last but certainly not least, uh, Mr. Jason Best, the co-founder and principal of Crowdfund Capital Advisors, LLC. <laughs> so let me, uh, let me introduce each of, uh, each of our panelists um, in more detail whilst we're waiting for Carl. Um, first to my right, uh, um, he's a tech entrepreneur with over 12 years of experience in founding, funding, and managing tech companies. Um, he's a founder and CEO of Ukbi, which is Southeast Asia's biggest e-book store with over 85% market share in Thailand. Ukbi has more than 200 apps in the app store. The apps have been in the top 20 of top grossing iPad apps in the Thai Apple App Store every day for the past 50 months. Um, Okbi now has um, more, than five, more than 7 million downloads and 5 million users um, with about 10,000 new users ad added every single day. Um, it's raised more, than, raised more than 9 million US dollars in the past 24 months. And uh, Mr. Uh, Kun Mo is also the founder and CEO of IT Works, a leading software company in Thailand. Ukbi was actually first started as a project within this company and then spun off in March 2012. So, warm, warm welcome to Kun Mo, please. And next to Kun Mo, we have uh, Mr. Andrew Dix, a seasoned digital media professional. Andrew is the CEO and co-founder of Crowdfund Insider, the leading news and information site for the global crowdfunding industry. Crowdfund Insider was founded in 2012, soon after the signing of the Jobs Act, 
Crowdfund Insider has been a leading voice and independent advocate of the disruptive innovation of crowdfunding. He's also a recognized authority in the crowdfunding world. Andrew recently co-authored um, a chapter in a book titled Crowdfunding, Current Market Dynamics. He's also on the advisory um, council of the Crowdfunding Professional Association. A warm welcome to Andrew, please. Next to Andrew, we have uh, Mr. Jason Best. Um, Jason co-authored the crowdfund investing framework used in the JOBS Act to legalize securities-based crowdfunding in the U.S. He was invited twice to, pr to provide a U.S. congressional testimony on early stage finance. And uh, he attended the White House Rose Garden ceremony for President Obama to sign the JOBS Act into law in April of 2012. Um, as a co-founder of the Crowd Capital Advisors, Jason works with professional investors, government, and multilateral organizations, including the World Bank, to create successful investing policy and educational strategies in early stage finance. Warm welcome to Jason, please. And last but certainly not least, we have, we have Carl. Um, Carl is the founder and CEO of Mass Solutions and publisher of crowdsourcing.org, two of the leading properties in the crowdsourcing crowdfunding arena. He's also the creator of the CAPS program, which is the Crowdfunding Association for Platform Standards for Crowdfunding Portal Best Practices. He's also a, thir thought, thought, a thought leader in crowd strategy and crowd adoption models. In the past five years, he's played a central role in pioneering and developing crowdsourcing and crowdfunding internationally. Not only putting crowdsourcing.org at the center of the nascent industry, but also developing mass solutions as an industry think tank, helping to develop standards, accountability, and implementation model for crowdsourcing and crowdfunding. A very warm welcome to Carl, please. So today we have, we have about a, an hour and a half or so um, to, to have uh, a discussion under the, it's a bit of a mouthful, this topic, right? And the topic we, we were given is actually innovative business with disruptive technology, driving digital economy and optimizing funding availability. Um, if someone can help me translate that, that would be very helpful. Um, so in any case, We'll simplify it into, into three main sections. Um, first of all, we will talk about the innovative landscape, the innovation, the disruptive innovation, um, perhaps globally, regionally, and, uh, um, and also especially in Thailand. Where are we at? Um, what's, what's really going on here? What's the ecosystem? Um, and in Thailand in particular, it's certainly something that's very, very new. Then we'll move on to how f crowdfunding is relevant to this startup, this entrepreneurial innovation um, um, uh, ecosystem. How important is it? Um, what is available? What is suitable? And lastly, we'll move on from uh, right now, a lot of, has been talked about in the reward-based crowdfunding uh, space. Um, and we have an expert here who, who who has actually uh, started the equity-based crowdfunding. Um, and if Thailand or the rest of the world is to move in that direction, what, what is the relevance, especially to investors? Right, so we're breaking this down into three sections and uh, uh, I'll be fielding a few questions on the stage here, but uh, at the end of each subsection, um, there should be a roaming mic going around. Um, so since we are in a crowdfunding summit, it would be remiss of me not to seek questions from the crowd, right? So I expect uh, all of you to please uh, participate in full. So to, to, to kick, kick things off, um, really, the innovation landscape. Um, what's happened in the last um, decade or so? Um, and 
I'd like to, to get a more global view um, first, global and regional, and then move on to Kunmu last for, for the Thailand view, because I'm sure that he has, he has a, lot, a lot to say in that space, which is very, very new. So perhaps, uh, um, perhaps starting from Jason. Thank you. Um, I guess if I'll, I'll try to confine, uh, talking about innovation, I mean, it's funny when I first got to Silicon Valley in 1998, uh, when the internet was shiny and new, uh, you know, it was to toss millions of dollars to do then what it costs hundreds of dollars to do today. Uh, and so the innovation has been sort of hard to sort of encapsulate all that in a, in a few sentences. But in fintech, in financial technology, the things I think that are, that are really moving forward, I think we've seen a lot of uh, the movement from the internet to the social web to apps to, to this kind of latest development of financial technology innovation is the moving of our lives and our relationships from an offline and institutional format to an online and individual format. Meaning, you used to have to go to a bank to get a loan. You to an institution. Now it's gonna be more indiv individual to individual. And we're using technology to be the intermediary where there typically had to be aggregators or companies between those things. And so I think that's one of the things that's really exciting and I think it pre presents a great opportunity for innovation um, throughout the region and the world around how we facilitate movement of money uh, movement of ideas, movement of intellectual property, uh, and so it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And Carl, do you have some thoughts in this, in this space? I think, um, I think to, to build perhaps a little bit on what Jason said, I think it's about um, the extent to which you can syndicate information and uh, gain access to much broader communities of individuals and things. So there's been a very significant um, change over, I guess, the last probably 10 years now. Um, so, you know, the adage used to be, you know, if it's not invented here, it can't be good. And now the adage is traditionally sort of you know, proudly invented elsewhere. And I think whether you use it to um, source talent and human capital to participate in that process, whether you use it to source capital, whether you use it to um, build a qualified customer base, these are the opportunities that I think uh, now avail themselves. Andrew? Yeah, so um, I'm going to agree with both Jason and, and Carl. Um, but what I think you've seen over the past 10 years, you've seen these, these uh, uh, regional epicenters of innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship like Silicon Valley, New York, London, Singapore, that evolved to be the epicenters for much creativity and, and, and new business development. What you're seeing with the crowd economy is you're creating a catalyst that can can take these these epicenters of innovation and broaden that out to a much wider audience, and that's a good thing. Now, data is still very early, and the initial data that, that at least I've seen, you still have the dominance of these centers, but I but I think that that's going to change over time. I'm very optimistic about that, um, but I think that that aspect of the crowd economy coupled with the growing acceptance and, and acknowledgement that small business is the creator, the, the most important creator of jobs and economic growth. Mm -hmm. And that for any economy on a national basis to excel in this area, you have to create an environment and an ecosystem that allows small business to start and to thrive and to sometimes fail. And I think that's a big change in the past decade, at least from my mm -hmm. perspective. Thank you very much. So you, you mentioned uh, uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, um, you mentioned Singapore, but uh, not Thailand yet. But uh, yet, I, 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 yet it's coming soon. And uh, I perhaps couldn't would argue that it's already beginning to, to be here. Um, yes. Um, the, the, the startup, especially the tech startup um, landscape in Thailand is seriously hot right now. And perhaps Kunmu uh, can, can elaborate on that. Yes, okay. So I, uh, I'm one of the startups in Thailand, so I can add like a perspective of a local startups. So basically my, my company, we are 
we found it like four years ago in that time. It's, uh, it's one of the first company that actually raised some uh, VC money. And then during the past four or five years, I mean, the ecosystem in the area is still a traditional way. So you start with like friend and family, and then there is like angel, like high network chipping in, and then there's a local VC and international VC. So in Thailand, recently we have a startup association. So it's like a couple hundred startup register. And last year, the member in the startup association, in total, they we calculate, and then in total, we raised around 80 million US dollars. Of course, it's, it's still very really small. In, like, like this is like the whole whole country startup in total raising around 80 million US dollars, which is probably smaller than one round of the big company in, in the US, but, but at least it's starting. So when, uh, when we are talk about uh, startup here, so we probably have around a couple hundred startups in the country, and around 15 companies that's already raised, right, Series A, and a couple companies, like my company, and another one, two company that go to Series B, and no, no really big exit so far. It's just like local M&A or sometimes like company from Singapore or Australia come in and take over the local company. So like one guy's name, Kun Paul Siwalakun, he, he found a company called Ensogo and he exit to, to uh, Group Bong, yes. uh, Living Social, sorry. And, and, and then he's uh, like serial entrepreneur, he start another company again. So, so the, the startup ecosystem is actually uh, starting from the group of people and now, now it's expanding. But, but of course, I, I see the, the coming of crowd start, uh, crowdfunding things that something is really exciting and then that's just speed things up for, for the local ecosystem. Yeah. What, is, what has enabled this, this sudden change? It's only happened in the past two, three years. I mean, um, I think basically we have to look at Southeast Asia as the next big thing in, in the global economy. So you have like, like a US market, you have like European markets, now then you go to China, now like Alibaba is like bigger than eBay and Microsoft, uh, Amazon combined, and then they have like India. So of course in Southeast Asia we have like 600,000 people, so, so uh, no, 600 million people, and that, that is like only after Facebook, India and China. So, so basically there's a, there's a huge potential of, of the local market. You see players like Lockheed Internet who, who raise a lot of money and try to, to grow the e-commerce uh, ecosystem here and and so many local example so so I think that's that's why it is the money is flowing in actually I, I can I can it's, it's kind of look like that there is more money in the invest uh, that willing to invest more than the startups that's ready to be invested that that's kind of like ecosystem now today yeah so, so, so you're suggesting that it's the 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 readiness of the of the startups themselves Money, money is easy to find. Is it's, that what you're uh, not, uh, not at the seed level or, or early level as the crowdfunding stage, right. I think. I mean, most of the, the VC here, here is kind of like waiting for, for because the, the, everyone is new, so, so there's really high chance that the company will be gone right, within a couple of years. So, so when, if you talk about Series A, so, so people kind of like waiting to, to see which startup is coming up and then pick that one. But, but after a couple of years, every company that's already close to the size that can be invested in series is, is all be invested. So, so now say they are like local seed funding, like all the telcos they try to, to ship in, they do like a incubators program. So there are t uh, three telcos in the country, each of them uh, arrange like a incubation program in, in their, in their cameras, then like, uh, incubate like five to ten uh, starts up every three months and then ship in like 500,000 baht, which is like, okay, just enough for, for them to, to run a couple of months to see if the, the product is taking off. But, but that's hardly enough compared to the whole, whole, whole economy. Yeah. But uh, to, to, for you, um, you know, specific to you, the telcos had, had a, a, a huge impact on, on, on yes, your yes. launch, right? Yes, yes. So, so my, my company, we do, uh, we do angel and seed uh, investment by ourselves. I, I was running my previous company and the, the project was starting in that, that company. And then uh, once the project is taking off, I got invested from, from uh, yeah, that guy there, Kun Tana Pong, so he's like, like uh, there, there's a VC called Inwen, so, so it's an investment arm of uh, InTouch, yeah, this is like Shin Corporation. So they, they, they invest a couple millions in my company and then we, we take off from, from there. Yeah, so, so telco is definitely help in, in, in our case. Yeah. Um, 
I, I noticed you didn't, uh, you didn't raise funds through crowdfunding. Yes, never. But but I I I, I raised like a reward program. I used to launch some like uh, last year we published one comics book and like uh, it's on uh, on Kickstarter. So basically we we run it for 21 days and then we print the local com uh, print the comics locally and we ship around the world. We raised around thirty thousand US dollar on Kickstarter in in three weeks. So so we know that oh this is this is something that's really working because it is. It's so easy to do that. I'm imagine that okay, you just you just shoot a video, you just like advertise in one page and ship it there, and then you you raise like yeah, thirty thousand. So yeah. Before before we move on to 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 the next topic, um, I'd like you to just very very briefly just outline um, what are the types of startups that are coming up in Thailand, specific to Thailand. Oh, they are uh, everything. Yeah, most most of them are e-commerce, basically. But right. many of them yeah. are marketplace, uh, payment. So basically, in in Southeast Asia, there are many problems to be solved, right? So when when there is many problems, like the logistic is sucks, for example, there are not many people using credit cards. Credit card penetration rate in Thailand probably like like in a teen yeah, percentage, like fifteen percent, for example. So so if you want to do e-commerce, so there will be a creative payment channel, like people start doing the motorcycle free and do like cash on delivery. So that is another startup, and then logistic another startup, uh, payment is another startup, and then when people when the ecosystem is not ready, you can see that Thai people is actually doing shopping on. They use Instagram as the shopping tool. So all the, all the market sellers, they start to open their Instagram account and post their products there. And then they put their live ID there. And then when you want to buy something, you have to chat with the, with the, with the product's owner. And then you go to the ATM, and then you transfer money manually on the ATM. And then you bring a large, chat, oh, I already transferred money to you. And then the, 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 the shop is like, oh, I got it, check the banks. So, so they, will be, they find a way, some way to do like e-commerce thing. And then, and then, of course, this is not hardly like convenience to do, right? So, so there will be startup to try to sell these kind of things, like basic thing that, that already is super normal in, in other region. Yeah. So creating that ecosystem. Um, yep. I think this morning I, I looked in the itinerary. I'm afraid I wasn't here, but uh, um, there was some the discussion sort of around payment gateways, digital payment, um, et cetera, that's, that's been raised. So that is also a, a one, one essential component to facilitate crowdfunding um, going into the future. Um, but at this juncture, are there any, any questions or any comments from the floor at all? No, I do realize it's after lunch. and. Uh, <laughs> Everyone perhaps is is uh, feeling a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit sleepy. But <laughs> um, our friend here, you uh, you keep that one. Let me take this. Okay. I, I was interested in um, you didn't use crowdfunding. You said you had some experience in, on Kickstarter, yeah. um, and maybe that was a function of of either less knowledge or less maturity at the point that you needed capital. But uh, so my question is, as you have seen the market develop and as you've successfully closed rounds yourself, um, would you, if you turn the clock back a couple of years, would you have been looking at crowdfunding as an alternative to raising the capital in the way you did? And what advice would you give other enterprises that have, that, have those choices to, to make? Oh, okay. So um, in, in my case specifically, uh, I have to say that I, when I try crowdfunding, I just tried it last year. I just want to know that uh, one, if I help one of my customers, this like they are comic writers on my platform. My company, we are doing like ebooks thing. So there's one writer who, who writes digital comics. And I try to say, hey, if I want to help this guy raising money, uh, what is the best way to do? So, so we go to Kickstarter and help him raise the money. But recently, there are a couple of local startups who successfully raise money on, on Kickstarter. They do, one of them is called Drybot. They, they do like a, a device where you plug it into a, a car. And, and they have an iPhone app. It's, it's tell you that, OK, how much uh, fuel you, you burn this, this day, this week, and how, uh, how to improve your driving to, in order to save some fuel. Something like that. So, so there are many startups who, at the really early stage, they just go direct to to crowdfunding. So, so again, if, if I have to say, if I want to uh, look, if I look back to that 
or the experience that I have with crowdfunding, I see it's like super, super duper cool things that, that because it's, it's so easy to do and, and in terms of investor, everyone just chip in small amount. So, so even this the company is like gone out of business, no one is really getting hurt that much. So, so, so it's a win, yeah, win scenario, I think. So, thank you. Um, Carl, Carl, Carl stole one of my questions. Oh, I, I was going to ask. <laughs> no, no, no problem. Um, but uh, m moving on to that, um, related to this, um, clearly different startups, different uh, um, commercialization process of, 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 um, of innovations um, require different types of funding. Um, and uh, perhaps uh, Jason could, could uh, give us some, some overview of um, what is, what is available and relevant to, to innovators in their commercialization process and what is appropriate for which, which type or stages even? Sure, I mean, I think uh, over the last nine or 10 years I've been, I've been coming to Thailand, I've definitely seen uh, the startup scene here really explode. And I think that part of it is about the entrepreneurs finding each other. Uh, and just knowing that you're out there and that you know who each other are and you, you can connect and, and find that you know, you're not the only one and that you can, help to, you can help each other to create whatever it is you kind of business you want to create. From a kind of how it gets utilized, it's um, typically on rewards-based crowdfunding, it's typically proof of concept, uh, much like uh, we were describing earlier of, of this idea of I have this thing I want to create I think I can do it, and if I have enough money to do a first production run of the object, then I can prove if I have a customer or not. And with that, I can then go to an angel investor uh, if, I, if I can and be able to raise money uh, more, more efficiently. And so that's certainly one of, the, uh, one of the things we see used. An example of that is a, one of the things I donated to on Kickstarter was uh, a, this particular kind of coffee pot that uh, was invented by someone who was working at a, at a coffee shop in Portland, Oregon, and thought he could do it a better way. He did it, uh, he, instead he wanted to raise $5,000 to raise enough money to do one production run of his coffee pot. He ended up raising $155,000 and now has a successful business. Um, so it's kind of proof of concept or proving that you have a customer or sometimes what's also called product market fit. Are people going to pay for this thing that you think is so amazing? Will they buy it? Um, Debt crowdfunding tends to be, uh, let, me, well, let me go back to equity. Equity crowdfunding tends to be where you have a business, you have, um, you've probably proven that you have a, a prototype and a, and, a, and a customer. Now you're ready to begin to see if you can get more customers. And you don't have cash flow yet. You're not going to have cash flow for some period of months or maybe a couple of years. But you need that money to be able to help you to begin to grow your business, to hire a couple of people, uh, and to begin to sell more services. Debt crowdfunding um, tends to be more for businesses that have cash flow, that are profitable, that can support debt payments. So these are businesses that are more substantial in size. Um, that are, could be, this are, this where, why Main Street businesses, kind of regular, more traditional SMEs, can use crowdfunding uh, more frequently that's debt crowdfunding because they can support those payments and they may not want to sell a piece of their uh, construction business or their dry cleaner or whatever the, the business may be. And so that's why you have these, it's, it's just like when you look at the, the funding continuum, the traditional funding continuum, angels, venture capital, private equity, investment, investment banks. The same thing is true in crowdfunding. And I actually think in a few years, we won't call it crowdfunding anymore, we'll just call it funding because it's just going to be part of this overall continuum of funding that takes place uh, so that companies can come into being and grow. And I notice in your continuum um, of funding, rarely does uh, bank debt financing factor into it, which is uh, certainly um, quite alien concept when banks are not involved, in, especially here in, in, in Thailand. Um, I, I, I had just finished, literally two days ago, the entrepreneurship, introduction to entrepreneurship class at Satsin for MBA students, and we look at the pecking order of funding for startups. Debt comes in way last 
because it's a cash drain. Uh, startups, what, the, what don't they have? They don't have cash. Um, so really, to be able to open up the, um, the funding options um, that is more in line with international practice would certainly spur the, um, the startup and innovation landscape here in, in Thailand. Um, and uh, perhaps, do you have something to add? Yeah, yeah. well, um, I, I was going to concur with what you said, but I was going to add that crowdfunding allows you to, to succeed or fail smarter, faster, cheaper. And this is kind of, kind of the new thing. And um, that's what you want. Uh, and, and again, there is no market without success. There is no market without failure. And, and talking about companies that, that are more applicable towards the crowdfunding ecosystem, in general, it's a consumer-facing business, but not to the exclusion of everything else. It's just when you have a product affinity or a service affinity for an investor, those have a tendency to become more popular, but it's not to the exclusion. So I, that's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and Carl, perhaps uh, you, you can give a, a, a more broader view of where crowdfunding, uh, where it is and where it's going, the changing landscape. Um, so um, can I just add a, a small amount just to that last discussion? So I, I liked uh, the way that Jason sort of described the continuum. And I think at the front end, and also you talking about um, um, how reward-based crowdfunding in effect would you know, be responsible for creating more startups in the first place. And I think there's a couple of things. Um, I think everybody might agree that we're seeing um, those people that raise money and sometimes over-raise have then got a supply chain issue. And there's a tremendous amount of um, service providers um, that are watching crowdfunding in order to provide additional support, collateral, and things of that nature. So it's become a, um, a place whereby um, people that have the necessary services and expertise, and that can be anything from capital to manufacturing capability to distribution capability, um, I think it's joining those entrepreneurs up with those service providers much, much sooner. That's one thing. I think the other thing is, um, I think it will, uh, I think it is um, fueling the venture capital uh, community and aspect as well because it's providing deal flow that previously was off the radar. So there's not only more companies to look at, but it's much easier and cheaper to observe what's happening in the context of crowdfunding in order then for the VCs to be able to come in um, having, uh, you know, much earlier and much larger deal flow. I think from the perspective of um, you know, where, where this is going, um, I mentioned um, in my discussion this morning, um, you know, the, I can give you some numbers. I mean, we've been surveying the uh, platform uh, market now, or the, number, you know, the CFP's crowdfunding platforms for about four or five years, four years, I think. Um, when we started, I think in 2012, there was like 465 platforms, and I remember that went to something like 650. Last, in 2013, when we did our survey, there was 850. Um, we've just completed our survey a few months ago. There's, 12, there's 1,250 platforms now globally, a very significant number. Um, if you look at the, I mentioned earlier again, if you look at funding concentration, it, it actually is very revealing in terms of the implications for new platforms coming onto the market. With, um, in the US, the larger platforms pretty well maintaining, you know, north of 90%, top, top five platforms maintaining north of 90%, actually 95% of the funding volume. So obviously the market's getting bigger, so there is funding going to these smaller entities. Um, but the concentration does not necessarily point towards a very diverse market. Um, the other thing that we found is that the, the sort of the break-even point for a very significant, very aggressive, um, large platform, I'm talking now the lending clubs and prospers and, and things of that nature, is about a billion dollars in transactions given, given, given the, the revenue models of these CFPs. So you've got to be very large and you've got to be scaling in order to create a sustainable, sustainable business. So um, what you're seeing is you're seeing platforms do a couple of things. First of all, many platforms are now mixing models. So you can raise, you know, you can raise debt and you can offer equity on the same platform or you can, do, you can lead with a reward campaign and then offer equity. So there's those options. 
Um, so those are what we call our hybrid models. Uh, and I mentioned there's some uh, specifically in sort of product orientated enterprises. There's the uh, introduction of these uh, royalty based models. Um, in particular, obviously, maybe not royalty is the best term, but sort of income sharing in, in, in a category such as real estate crowdfunding. So you're seeing those changes to the models, and then you're also seeing um, much more focus in terms of um, platforms that are singularly focused on particular demographics. So that's, you know, it might be uh, minority-owned businesses, it might be veterans, something of that nature, in particular geographies, because uh, a lot of crowdfunding is very localized, um, you know, you might be more likely to invest in a local restaurant chain if you live in the area and you frequent it. Um, so that's another area of spe specialization. And then it, obviously in certain sectors. Um, I was asked a question earlier in terms of which are the best performing categories. And interestingly, this year, that business and entrepreneurship has emerged as the leading category across financial and non-financial. Social causes always used to be the leading category, certainly in non-financial crowdfunding business entrepreneurship uh, in 2013 became the second largest. So again, in the information that we're releasing soon, you'll see that business and entrepreneurship, very interestingly, is now the dominant uh, category. But there are certain categories that are moving very quickly. Science and technology is a good category, um, film and performing uh, arts. And then the emerging uh, category, which I've referred to, very interesting, that's growing extremely fast, is the whole real estate area. I've learned to say real estate. I used to say property for many years. But just basically, um, you know, not the old syndication model where there have been plenty of web portals that have really just been syndicators for real estate, but portals that are really participating either in bridge financing um, or as a, principal, as, as a principal sponsor on the project, but portals that are um, making various different subclasses of real estate accessible um, to investors that now no longer need to be you know, close to where the uh, investment properties are. We're seeing a tremendous amount of that merge. Um, perhaps uh, Kun Mu can, 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 can share a little bit uh, um, specifically um, how you have utilized um, crowdfunding platforms. I know you've had, uh, um, you've dabbled in it in, in, in you know, a few of your projects, but uh, uh, with that experience in mind and your, your experience uh, with uh, getting getting uh, institutional funding, um, especially your Series B um, recently. Um, in light of all of that, what would be your recommendation for, for startups exploring the crowd pl funding platform? I think uh, every startup, if you have a chance, you should try crowdfunding because like, there is no minus size, only upside using, using it. Like, uh, like we talked earlier, that the most important thing for a startup is to find the, the product market fit, and crowdfunding is actually the fastest way to, to do. Because like, instead of going to talk to investors and try to pitch them and try to get the money to do the prototype, at the end of the day, you have to prove that the product that you develop is that somebody want to, to, to buy it, somebody want to use it. So this is just levers the, the process, so you go to the market first, without just a, like a prototype and a video and then like pitching to the, the crowd. And then if they like it, they will, they will, they will give you some amount, uh, small amount of money. And then many of them, like everyone chip in and then you have enough fun to, to go to do the product to become a reality. So, so I think it's, it's, the, it's really innovative and uh, probably the best way to, to start. But, but going beyond that, you, of course, you see startup that starting with uh, crowdfunding and then move on to the institutional money. So like the most popular one should be Pebble, right? Everyone know the, the, the smart waters try to raise an end of like 10 million and then they become huge company eventually. So, so they are so, uh, again, so I think every startup should, should try if you, if you can, yeah. So crowdfunding, especially reward-based, is a fantastic way to, to to, to use as to, to validate your market, that you yeah, have yeah. a market, yeah. right? Um, that you actually have paying customers willing to buy your product. Yes. And, um, then, and then it's kind of like, since it's reward based, right? So it's not really involved into your, your equity yet. So, so I think this is fit well for, for the early stage startup. But right. yeah, for equity based, I, I really yeah, don't have much experience on, on that. Yeah. And, and I think likewise, most of us don't have much experience in the um, e equity. Um, 
crowdfunding side. So uh, let's turn it over to the experts to give us the ABCs of uh, um, equity um, crowdfunding. Um, Jason, please. Where would you, where should I start? Um, just give us the most basics and we can work up from there. Um, I, I think that the, um, maybe I'll start with some perspective. When we first started talking about equity crowdfunding, um, professional investors in the United States were um, between skeptical and hostile to the idea because they said, you know, we know best, we are the professional investors, um, you know, how can, you know, those people over there, you know, understand all this important decision making that we can make on our own. And they, they, they also said things like, we would never invest in a company after it's been used equity crowdfunding. Um, and so just like Carl was saying, what this has done is it, we're still in just the very earliest stages of, of equity crowdfunding in, in the world. But what it's done is it, it's dramatically increased the amount of deal flow that venture capitalists and angel investors have access to. A friend of mine who is a VC in Silicon Valley, he invests in hardware and in tech hardware. And he says every morning, part of his routine is to have a, his first cup of coffee and scan through Kickstarter for hardware campaigns that are trending or that have reached their goal or are nearing their goal. Because it's all about who can get to that entrepreneur first, start building that relationship, and, and make it happen. So I think that you know, the message that we bring to new markets is in equity crowdfunding is to existing investors, this is good for you, uh, not dangerous. And I'll, to, to demonstrate that, I mean, the, uh, the CEO of the Business Angel Network in the UK, we were talking after a, an angel investing event, and she said, you know, two years ago, our, my angel networks across the UK were very terrified of, of crowdfunding, and now they're all, you know, going to the events and on, the, on those sites and that kind of a thing. So, I mean, that's just kind of a backdrop of historically what's changed and how, how big of a change we've seen in just, you know, two and a half or three years. The, the concept of, of equity crowdfunding is, is um, very similar to angel investing. You're making a high-risk investment in a startup or small business that has a high degree of likelihood that it will fail. Uh, and, but you are betting on the team. You are betting on the product that you believe in and the entrepreneur that they can succeed. Um, and so that's, that's really the opportunity that you're, that you're investing in. And that's why it takes a lot of trust and that's why it takes a lot of relationship. That's why the data I shared earlier about the campaign that I ran here in Thailand and, and Kickstarter campaign in Thailand and in the US to raise money for a documentary film that I did, it was around people that were first or second degree connections with the, uh, the people that we knew in both markets. And the same thing is true in equity crowdfunding as well. Over time, that will change. Over time, as we build more financial technology that allows us to have better transparency into markets and individuals and into companies that will allow us uh, data standardization, those sorts of things that will allow us to make these investments for a retail investor in Vietnam to make a, re a crowdfunding investment in Bangkok, right? Uh, because you were talking about that kind of regional kind of movement of money. But I think that that will take some time to develop. For the near term, for the next few years, it will be people within each country making their own uh, investments. Not the least of which reasons is that each country obviously has its own securities regulations. And so one of the big opportunities for the SEC here in Thailand and to coordinate with the other S the securities commissions across ASEAN, while each country is going to advance this type of legislation at its own pace, it's really important, I believe, uh, to have the securities commissions in these countries to continue to collaborate and communicate so that you understand uh, how each country is making these decisions and so you can, uh, can know how, for example, Malaysia and Singapore are making their decisions around, around moving forward with equity crowdfunding versus Vietnam or Cambodia or, other, or Indonesia or other markets. And so that kind of coordinate of at least just understanding of the decisions you're trying to make, the issues you're trying to solve, um, the opportunities that you have, 
those kinds of collaborations can be very, very powerful, I think, in accelerating the market. You, you mentioned uh, that uh, you're talking about uh, VCs, etc., institutional investors. Um, right now, the equity-based crowdfunding platforms, are they only open to institutional investors right now or to retail investors as well? Do you want me to take this one? Please. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in right now. First of all, in the United States right now, we only have accredited crowdfunding. That means you must be an accredited investor to participate in equity crowdfunding offers on the various portals. You also do have some institutional money in there as well. Uh, the, the laws are different in different countries. I always kind of default to what's going on in the UK because they are the most advanced in many respects, not in all, but there anybody can participate in an equity crowdfunding round. Uh, and you do also have uh, institutional participation there as well. So uh, you, what Jason said is, is that originally uh, there was a lot of apprehension and fear from the angel and VC community. You've seen that kind of shift where they're starting to embrace and accept the fact that this is going to become part of their ecosystem and it's something that they can take advantage of. And I think the flip side of this is, you know, you don't stand in front of a, a, a moving train because the outcome is bad. You know, the world is changing. This is going to be the new way that you raise capital in a lot of different uh, circumstances. So, um, again, this is very early in the game. The, the data is very nascent. Uh, the deals aren't quite that big. Even in the UK today, you've raised less than 100 million pounds, which is the most evolved ecosystem. Um, so it's really just the beginning. Um, and I think it's important to keep that in mind when we look at the way things are now, because it's evolving, changing every single day. Carl, do you have any, your take on this? I was actually, do you mind if I was just going to ask one clarification first, if, is that, if that's okay? Um, you said um, in the UK it was um, anybody can participate, and, and, and I, is that um, with respect to particular platforms or in general? Um, it's in general. In general. In general. Um, so I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> your, the, what's your take on the, on the equity-based? Um, crowdfunding platforms, where, where it is now, where it's, where it's going. Um. Um, so, um, as, as my um, friends here will know because of the fact we've, you know, we've been very active in this for a few years, I think that um, because of the anticipation as a function in the US of the Jobs Act being signed 5th of April, Jason, 2012, yeah, okay. Um, you know, people expected the floodgates to be opened, and there was a tremendous amount of um, uh, uh, expectation um, in terms of um, how quickly one would be able to do what Andrew's just confirmed, which is, uh, you know, uh, selling equity to non-accredited, non-qualified in investors. Um, so I think as a function of that, everybody uh, categorized crowdfunding as um, you know, this complete change to 80-year-old securities regulations to just completely restructure and allow this, um, you know, wild crowdfunding to start taking place. And I think because of the delay in implementing Title III, which was the, uh, what I'm referring to in terms of selling securities to non-accredited investors, it took a while for the market to perhaps think that um, you could apply crowdfunding technologies and principles to existing fundraising activities. Um, and therefore, the ability, for example, Angel, for Angels List as an example, to be able to incorporate the technology and the social media in order to be able to just do what it did in a more dynamic um, you know, manner that allowed faster and greater distribution. So it took the market a while to adjust to that. And people, you know, in part because they we're going to run out of money waiting for Title III to be implemented, we're able to morph and recalibrate exactly what this meant. And I think as a function of that, a number of the platforms pivoted and focused um, under Title II, specifically targeting accredited investors. And I think that's been good from a number of perspectives. Certainly, obviously, it's enabled some um, certain platforms to 
start participating in the market, start developing the best practices, start creating and capturing some market share, start proving the model. So it's been very good from that perspective. Um, so I think that's, you know, I think that's um, the, the sort of the primary observation that's, that's happened. And then and the reason I asked you that question, Andrew, again, just because there's a lot to keep up with in terms of different marketplaces and jurisdictions. I know in the UK what I was aware of, and I'm not saying this to challenge what Andrew said, but I was aware that the UK government, and I should know this because I'm British, but the UK government were sort of uh, taking a macro level view as well as a sort of a, um, a view of what was happening, happening with particular platforms. So they, you know, on one hand, they were allowing certain platforms to emerge and to start, you know, learning from the experience of, pe of platforms operating while at the same time, not slowing them down, but at the same time, thinking about how to regulate and govern the market as a whole, which I thought was a very interesting approach. It's just one approach, not necessarily the best approach, but it allowed the market to continue to evolve. Um, and I think one other thing in the US is, and I'm saying this because of, uh, you know, we, we're, we're familiar with some of the uh, technology offerings. So there's a lot of offerings that are coming out um, that are being adopted, which support the licensing of what we call white label software. And one of the interesting observations in that space is that that market is served by, at one end, platforms that have very, very significant compliance built into them. And at the other end, they're very basic transaction platforms that you know, that, that don't in themselves handle much of the compliance issues. And what's been interesting is even those funding portals that have licensed the software that doesn't focus terribly on compliance, where you would expect the SEC in the US to have jumped on those from the perspective of um, not conforming, uh, there's been very little of that. So even in the US, it seems from that that the SEC is st is is, is allowing some of the market activity to develop in order to make observations about where the issues are and um, what needs to be addressed. Um, I, I'd like to jump in here for a second because we're talking about debt as well. And when you talk about peer-to-peer -peer lending within the United States, it, it's seen exponential growth in the past couple of years. The only way that growth could have occurred in the United States is because of institutional money. And that um, calling it P2P anymore is, in some sense, is becoming a misnomer because of the degree that institutional funds are pouring in there. Uh, but that's also allowed the platforms to scale quite dramatically. And I think for the United States specifically, it's imperative that Prosper and Lending Club, they're sensitive to the needs and demands of a an accredited or a retail investor to be able to maintain that, that participation level and not to be pushed out by the institutions. But there's a reason why the institutions are going there is because they found a great way to make an excellent return on investment from a risk-adjusted reward, you know, risk-adjusted return basis. And, and, and that's a little bit different in the UK because the UK is more truly peer-to-peer. -peer. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, so, so, so now the, we're looking at institutional investors, we're looking at uh, accredited investors, um, but uh, for any crowdfunding fun platform, you need the crowd, right? Are there, are there enough of the crowd to, to, to push this along um, at this stage yet? And what are the major, um, what are the major concerns? Um, preventing it really skyrocketing for the time being. Um, maybe start with, with Carl. Um, so again, it, uh, one has to be really conscious of not always giving this US perspective on things, okay? So please ex excuse for that. And maybe, maybe you, can, uh, you can draw parallels relative to the local market. I'm less aware of obviously how many, you know, whether there's even a category of qualified investors and things of that nature. But I know, for example, in the US there's nine million um, thought, thought to be 9 million accredited investors, and that's, that's based on the current definition of an accredited investor. Um, and again, if, if I'm wrong here, correct me, but I, I, I believe it's um, you know, a minimum net income of 250,000 a year, a million in net assets apart from you know, your primary residence. Um, and on that basis, you know, this group of 9 million uh, potential people are accessible. Um, but within that 9 million people, and again, I can't remember the number and I'd like to be reminded of it, but um, a very small percentage of that 9 million um, currently are 
um, interested in investing in early stage businesses. Do you remember, Jason, or whatever the, I mean, it's. I've heard, I've heard estimates between three and 7%. Yeah, and you, I mean, it was single, single digit. So, you know, you have a very small population there um, that is actually interested. So obviously that may be down to a number of reasons. Um, it may, maybe that number changes as a function of reaching those investors through these new means. Um, but one of the considerations um, that the, you know, the SEC has forwarded is uh, changing the definition of the credit investor or changing, changing the um, attributes of a, of a credit investor uh, to um, increase the $1 million threshold to $2.5 million and to increase the uh, annualized income from 250000 to 500000 and I have actually one of my colleagues at the moment is trying to work out what that means in terms of what does that do to that nine million. We think that reduces that to something as, as low as two million people. So certainly from the perspective of um, under Title II in the US, um, that is a very small, potentially very small population, which changes substantially um, under Title III if you can figure out how to get access to you know, how many people, Jason, would it increase the number of potential investors by 300, you know, 250 million or something, or, I mean, a very substantial number, it changes the game. So, um, so I, think, I think, you know, clearly, clearly it does limit, but then the other thing is, um, you know, I, I don't think a testing ground, a period of time, a testing ground whereby you can see how crowdfunding performs with a group of investors that are supposed to be more savvy is necessarily a bad thing because what you learn from that will help you better design the mechanisms necessary to regulate it or to ease off regulation um, as you expand that investor base. Can I ask a question? Like, uh, if I have a startup, you want to do like... <laughs> okay. Okay. I don't start your question, by the way. Yeah. So if I'm a startup and I want to do equity crowdfunding in the US, normally what is the average size of the, the funding and how long it's going to take? Because like VC, if you talk about VC, you talk about like at least three months to six months. So that does speed things up and the amount, what is the size? Okay. You're, you're squeezing data out of me that I, that I haven't published yet. And I've got a journalist two down from me, so <laughs> <laughs> so the um, I can let me start with saying the average size of an equity investment um, in 2012 was 90,000 US dollars. Okay, that's um, globalized. Okay, global. 90,000 US dollars. The average size of um, an equity round now. Is, is very different across different continents. It's very different in Asia, in the UK, and in America. In the US, um, in the last uh, uh, 12, 13, 14, last couple of years, it's increased to about $170,000, dollars $180,000. Okay? Um, in the UK, um, what very, very interestingly actually, looking at all categories of crowdfunding, we found that the average size of a raise in the US was typically about 60, 65% across all models mm -hmm. of a raise um, outside the US, outside North America, which I thought was very interesting. And that's even in reward and donation space as well. And I don't know if that's a, a currency issue, you know, an, F, an exchange rate issue, but it was interesting to observe that. Um, the average size of um, an equity-based raise um, in Europe and Asia for, a, for an enterprise is, is closer to about $300,000. I see, and then uh, how long is usually to raise on the crowdfunding? Uh, yeah, yes. that? um, we, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I could, you know, I, could, I could tell you anecdotally from the perspective of you know, an awareness that most of these campaigns are probably you know, three months live. Mm -hmm. If, again, if anybody's got a different view on that, there, are, there have been some very exceptional campaigns. Um, La South America in 2000, uh, 2013 benefited from uh, the funding of Colombia's uh, tallest building, and it was uh, BD Batca, uh, I think was the name of the property. And $171 million was raised from 3,100 Colombian investors and that campaign took two years. So it changes, you know, given the objectives, given the, um, you know, given, given the venture. And for example, if you say like a 100,000 size uh, fundraisings, what do you think is like 
uh, 100 people putting in 1,000 checks or like 10 people putting in like 10,000 checks? I think that's something that you can, you can specify and you can control. Um, I mean, I, and I think different platforms will have different approaches in terms of how they would guide you in that regard. They like do have a minimum amount. You, you can you can set obviously you can oh, set okay. minimum amounts. Absolutely, you can set minimum amounts. And obviously, you know, if you have existing investors, I mean, that's a different matter as well because existing investors will have a very strong opinion in terms of um, their desire to participate with investors that have, have been uh, secured through crowdfunding. Yeah, just to, um, it, this is in part anecdotally, but uh, most of the equity crowdfunding rounds that you've seen become successful today, they've seen fewer than 200 investors. And you aren't getting thousands of thousands of investors, at least today, now, but that's what you've seen. It's a smaller number of investors. Uh, Crowdcube recently published their data on that, and it was uh, a little bit less than 200. Um, I know this is something that Paul Niederer has written about recently, that in, in his um, experience, it hasn't been thousands and thousands. Now, that could change, and, and you mentioned Title III. You know, we still don't know what's going to happen in the United States for, for non-accredited crowdfunding. Um, for, for, for institutional investors, they're, they're actually generally very active investors. They get, actually get involved in, in, in these projects, these, these startups. Um, is that also possible with a crowdfunding um, equity based platform? Um, let me, I, I just wanted to take it off on a bit of a tangent here. Uh, in the United States, uh, real estate, as you've mentioned, has been very hot in the crowdfunding space, and it's not really a startup genre, uh, but you're seeing a ton of institutional money. You know, point their funds in that direction. Uh, we just published something last week where um, Fundrise announced uh, six funds committing a hundred million dollars. Well, that's you know that's that's lunch money. That's you know something to, to take home. Um, but that's not the only one that's made an announcement where they've had significant institutional money pointed at their direction. Uh, and again, it's you know it, it's the, the return they're seeing. So the, 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 the same questions. The, the, the nature of the involvement of the investors, um, you know, VCs typically will take a, a board position or they'll get very involved um, to make sure when investors clearly, they want their money back, right? It's Absolutely, I think different countries and different platforms are taking different approaches to uh, on investor relations. And I kind of referred to this earlier in the day, but I think that there are, um, there's a lead investor model that some platforms have adopted. So you have uh, someone who may be a traditional angel who takes a lead position and then syndicates that deal to other retail investors at the same terms uh, as a way to uh, give access to, to deals that this particular uh, lead investor might have. Uh, it's also a way for the lead investor to test appetite for the company and the, and the product among a broader set of people. Help to reduce their risk also. But I think the, the, the big opportunity is really in, a, in, again, it's the technology to allow better investor communication over time. And so how can we, how can we recreate investor relations at scale when you have 100 investors or 150 investors? So you do it in a way that the entrepreneur is not spending uh, you know, days, uh, every, a week, a month in communicating via email with every one of their investors. And so they, we have to be able to use social tools to do that. Uh, we need to, we're seeing the very, very beginnings of that right now in crowdfunding platforms, the discussion forums. Uh, a lot of the equity platforms will have video chat capabilities with the entrepreneurs at, at you know, kind of monthly or quarterly video chats that can be available offline as well as online uh, in real time. And so there's different tools that people are beginning to put together, but overall I think eventually what we would see, I, I, I hope, is a company that creates a really great way for investors to communicate with their companies that then is, can be sold as a service across a number of different platforms. The other added advantage of that is then you're, you as the investor are going to one place to have access to a number of your investments instead of having to go many places for that. So essentially, I think, it, you know, like you said, the issue of scale, this really facilitates the scale, so you're not having to 
pitch to and update to um, each individual investor um, or, or, or privately, right? Um, and perhaps uh, Kunwu can share the, 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 fu the fundraising, your, your experience in fundraising. Um, how long has that taken you and what trials and tribulations did you have to go through to, to secure that, uh, that big tranche, your, your Series B? Okay, so my Series B uh, happened after, I think, maybe over 30 pitches. <laughs> Yes, and not only in Thailand, because like when you try to raise like a bigger checks, right? In the time we try to raise like seven million, so there's so few people in Thailand who are willing to give you seven million checks, and so so we try to going out of Thailand. So so actually, I went to see uh, many top uh, VC like Sequoia and many others one and and also uh, corporate VC. And I, I used to do have a business in, in Japan, so I have some relationship there. So, so we, would, we would like fly to Japan for a week and then every day have like three, four meetings with all these corporate and VCs and, and do a pitching. So at the end of the day, it took us um, almost six months just before, yeah, before everything start to settle into place and then another couple months negotiating. So yeah, so, so that, that's how long it takes traditionally, yeah. Uh, B rise are seven million US. Yeah. yeah. So, so that that was for equity, right? For, for equity, yes. Okay. So we now know the valuation of your company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's on um, paper, everything is paper. <laughs> um, do we have any? Do we have any questions from the floor? From the audience? Very quiet crowd. Please, please, Hong Sin. I, I surely have question. It's just that I reserve for the floor to ask. Um, I, I think this question is actually for Whoopi. That um, you know, would you actually be uh, now that you are actually funded? Um, you know, are you looking at any further expansion? Um, into you know more region or oh yes definitely uh -huh. so 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 I, hang on my okay. question have <laughs> okay thank you so, so since you're looking yes. at expansion yes. you know what other means of funding are you looking at exploring yeah so so in in my case like every other startup so we were looking for Southeast Asia every single country is kind of like too small if you want to scale the, the company because when you talk about startup you talk about digital business I mean of course there are so many people in the in Southeast Asia but if you talk about digital business and the number of people who are willing to pay money for this digital thing is is quite a small percentage so in order for us, every startup to grow after a couple of years when they prove the concept they have to grow out of the single countries to, to other countries. So, so we raised our series and then now we have office in Vietnam, Malaysia and Philippines and this year we're going to have an office in, in Indonesia. So we grew from like five people to over 200 people now in, in the last three and a half years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see. But what would be, I mean with your views on the expansion, would you be looking at additional funding? Oh yes, of course, because every country I expand in, i losing money again because you open a new office, hire new people. So the more you expand, you're going to need more, more funding. So it's like, it's always like for startup, you try to raise the money to, to be enough to use for the next 12 to 18 months usually. So, so it means that um, we are constantly money raising machines. So after you finish the first, first round, okay, we start looking for the next round already. That, that's what's happened in, in startup life. Yeah. Okay, so what other options would you consider other than the traditional VC? Because since that, that, that is something that you've been doing, would you be looking, uh, exploring at crowdfunding? Yeah, if, if definitely if the size of the, the, the crowdfunding can be that big and the market is ready, I. In, in terms of startup, probably if it's my case, I, I would like to, to know who is the who are the investors. Of course, if in that case, when you need a bigger check and then there's like hundreds of people funding my company, probably there's like hundreds of voice, like people try to tell you to do this and then hundreds of them. So so that's kind of not expecting results that we, we would like to, to have, of course. But but if you're rowing back to the early stage, I think 
like if it's kind of like like uh, smart money, so people put it in and kind of like help you validate the products, help you. Mm -hmm. um, they, they can be putting money and then they will love you so much that they come back and buy our products, right? So, so that I think is, is really good for, for the earlier stage. But, but that is for technology startup. Of course, if, mm -hmm. if you guys are talking about like real estate, of course that's going to be super, super big, yeah. Mm, and, and sorry, I have just one more question because uh, I, I think we still have a little bit of time. Nick, you, you have been in the startup space are, or entrepreneur have been supporting the startup and entrepreneurs. So your views as far as Thailand is concerned in terms of uh, crowdfunding from reward to potentially equity. Though equity is still at infancy stage, but you know what is your own personal views in terms of the light and the potential of equity crowdfunding in, in Thailand? I didn't realize moderators get questions. <laughs> you, but, uh, you ask me questions, but, but, yeah. so I become but, uh, moderator. <laughs> clearly, the, 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 the reward-based um, crowdfunding is a natural. Um, and uh, I've, I've seen you know, some of my, you know, my mentees and, and, and students um, putting their, their prototypes, their products on Kickstarter and things. And uh, um, there's one instance where um, this pair of brothers, they pulled, they, they pulled the campaign um, because simply most of the, the, the is, these are all pre-sales, they have to deliver on the product, they have to ship it to the US. Now that's, that's, a, that's a huge, huge stumbling block for them. Um, they probably got their, you know, their calculations a little bit wrong and uh, um, and didn't realize how much it would cost, especially when they're not doing it to scale. Um, so to have the presence of these well-established platforms in Thailand or, or, or Southeast Asia for the Asian market, um, I think would be a huge, huge boost to start off with. Um, moving into equity side, uh, um, when you see the rest of the world, you know, far more advanced and have been doing it longer than us, still haven't quite got it down to a T yet. Um, and uh, seeing at the speed of adoption, especially um, the required changes in the regulations, et cetera, that happens in Thailand, which is um, not as rapid as, as some other countries, shall we say. Um, perhaps that will be a little while off. Um, but I'm hoping that uh, the regulators and, and, and people involved in this room that are here, and I, I understand a third of the audience are from, from, from the regulator side, perhaps they can, they can speed things up to facilitate this. Um, one reason, it's just a, a little bit of a tangent, but uh, um, in recent years, before the tech startup scene in Thailand really, really heated up, um, any good ideas and good new ventures that come up, tech, tech startups that come up, the advice was go to Singapore. Incorporate there, get your funding there, come back to operate here. Because the ecosystem just wasn't here. It, it just wasn't present. Now, that's not so much the case anymore. Um, still to some degree, but, uh, but actually you're getting investors actually coming into Thailand to, to, to source um, startups to invest in um, because there is so much buzz and creativity here. Um, I would say probably, you know, a large factor is because of uh, the various um, tech startup co-working spaces that are really, you know, getting everyone together. A bit like Silicon Valley, so you, you're getting all the creative, um, uh, the, uh, the creativity all in one room, one space, people are talking and helping each other. Um, a bit like, uh, you know, open innovation, so to speak. Um, so, so these are things that are really happening here in Thailand. Um, but we are a, a long way off, but things are happening very, very rapidly in, in the private sector. Not, not so much on, on the regulator side, but with the push from the regulators too, we can fly. Um, that, that's what I truly believe. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's possible, but I'll speak up anyway. There's another one. Oh. Yeah, that's better. 
since Singapore has been mentioned a number of times, I thought I'd better stand up and ask a question. Uh, Manoj Sharma, Action Community for Entrepreneurship Singapore. Um, I'm fascinated by the perspectives that the panel has uh, brought. But uh, a very specific question to ask uh, Natavut uh, and Nick specifically. If there were three things you felt was very, very important for the Thai entrepreneurship ecosystem, to be present in the Thai entrepreneurship ecosystem, what would those three things be? Oh, okay, so let, let me go with this. So I think um, you need a lot of good example. That is, of course, it's like, first thing you have something to like, look up to. Okay, this guy can do it, so I can do it too. Of course, people see like, a lot of good example in the US, and uh, people read about Facebook, blah, 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 blah. But the mentality here at the beginning is like, hey, this, this is like US, this is not, not gonna happen in, in here. So the more people who, who have like a good example, that is the first thing. And then those people who have to make it have to be come back and kind of do like mentorship to, to the second generation. Like it's, it's not generation, it's like every year you just come back and do some talk, it's like inspire them. And then of course you need a lot of uh, investor to support them. At the end of the day, it's also about money, right? You, you can have your dream, you can have your, your minty, but then you need some money to, to start. So, so I think maybe yeah, one, two, three, yes. Um, I'm, I'm along the same line, really. Um, it's, it's clear that we need role models, right? Someone to look up to. Um, that's really true with, with, with most things, in fact. Um, so, Kunmu, Kunata Wood here is one such. Uh, he's someone that a lot of startups look up to, um, having, having um, already got, gotten outside investment um, and, uh, um, and made huge success. Um, and it, not only just in Thailand, but in the region, like uh, Lazada, et cetera, that's, that's you know, uh, valued in, in, in the billion, um, billion, billion dollar for an Asian um, Southeast and Asian company. I kind of have like, like stu stupid question to ask you. So like in, in Thailand, for example, if there is no regulation, for example, just like, like one, one company, they just open a website and start selling their shares on the web, what's what gonna happen? Like, yeah, it's like they can do it, and then 100 people pay some amount and they just go to register at the department, yeah, like super long list of people, um, they can. I think that's probably just called fraud. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, our, our, the, the, the Thailand um, regula regulators are, 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 are a lot stricter um, than that. It's not as liberal as that yet. Um, but uh, co coming back to, to, to the former question, apart from the role model, um, clearly you need the investors as well, um, and, and also the, the actual entrepreneurs themselves, right? technologists or entrepreneurs. Um, I'm based at uh, Xiong Kwan University, and uh, w what we find there is that technologists and entrepreneurs are not really speaking the same language. Right? There real there is that that cultural barrier um, breaking down. And, and Thailand in general, we're we're not that great. We, we, many organisations are very silo based. Right? So, you know, one department doesn't quite always talk to the next department. And you know, to, to break down that barrier, to have everyone talk, um, to, to find a common goal, common language, um, and, uh, and the system has to support that as well, right? Uh, the intellectual property um, uh, offices of these various centers and things need to also understand both the needs of the technologists as well as um, the, the entrepreneur, all right? And, and that's, for me, personally, that's the biggest stumbling block so far for me um, that, that, that I face. Um, I don't, uh, uh, the, the investment, I feel if, there's, if you have good stuff, people will come, so to, so to speak. And, that's, and we're seeing that. We're definitely seeing that right now, um, especially in the past two years. In Thailand, there's like a digital economy yeah. trend thing yeah. that, that's going Most on. Definitely. Yeah, Most so, definitely. So I think like even the government, they, yeah. they kind of like look into this and yeah. try to help. Jason, you have so Just here. an outsider's view. Um, from other markets, there's been research that was done by Endeavor about kind of beginning an ecosystem and the data they showed. I believe the number was five. Five kind of success stories in an ecosystem is enough because then you have those five entrepreneur, entrepreneurial teams that help to create those successful businesses that go on to create other successful businesses themselves. 
and inspire other people to create successful businesses also. And they talk like in, in um, uh, so they, they've kind of done this research in a number of markets. And I thought that was very, very interesting. So what I thought is also great about that is it's not a hundred companies that have to have exits to, you know, uh, IPO, it's five. And so that's why, I'm, it's, that's why it's really an exciting time here because there's so much activity and things going on in the space. And the, the co-working and, and those sorts of things, it's, it, you cannot underestimate the value of finding each other as an entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, I saw that happen in a two-year period of time in Mexico City, where when I first went there, they, they, they are, there were lots of entrepreneurs. They didn't know where each other were, and the investors did not know where to go to find them. Uh, since that time, there's a neighborhood in, in, uh, where a lot of startups are taking place in Mexico City, uh, and that it, there's a lot of activity happening around that. Um, the last thing I think that the examples are really important for is sometimes the most important problem that every country faces and every entrepreneur faces, it's that very difficult conversation you have to have with your parents that you don't want to take the traditional job a as an attorney or at the bank, but you want to do this thing, be an entrepreneur. Which, and explain to them that entrepreneur is not a code for an unemployed son, right? It's like, it actually is a, it's a good thing, or daughter, right? It's a good thing. And so that's why that c difficult conversation, uh, which takes place in the United States as well, um, you know, is important. And, and that kind of conversation perhaps is uh, very, very difficult for Asians. Um, like Asian failure is not acceptable, basically, right? right? So, so I think that does have to be changed. Yeah, we have to look at failure as something that is really, really acceptable. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're, we're running to the end, so perhaps can we have some, uh, some last words, final words of advice for, um, for the Thai, uh, both regulators, entrepreneurs, or you know, the, uh, the, the, industry, the crowdfunding industry? Um, maybe start from you, Carl. I wanted longer to think about an answer there. Um, some advice to which stakeholder group? Pick one. Pick one. Um, so this has, um, in most jurisdictions that I've been aware of, and I'd be interested if anybody sees anything different, is it's very much been a grassroots movement. So it's very much organic, it's about people being inspired regarding the model, and in most of the markets that you know, I've, I've seen, um, the grassroots movement has been ahead, you know, that's the, that's the horse. It's been ahead of the cart, okay, quite significantly. I think, and one of the things obviously that I've, I have an opportunity to see and I find really exciting is when you see a particular country that has the potential to, to do things differently and to take a very competitive position. I get very excited about Malaysia with their digital jobs program because there's no other country that's matching that. Um, one thing that was really apparent to me today attending this is the support that the marketplace has from the Thailand SEC, and I think the presence, the sponsorship, um, what we heard this morning from our keynote speaker, suggests that Thailand can take a really uniquely competitive position globally when it comes to this marketplace. Okay, um, you know, obviously time will tell in terms of how that pans out, but it feels like, um, you know, um, there is an opportunity for a country to take a very lead position, and that won't just affect its local marketplace, that will affect its standing in the world. Okay? And if you're, if you're smart enough about it, I'm sure you have uh, no shortage of uh, intellectual capacity, but if you act on what, it's, what it seems like you're talking about today, um, there's a really exciting opportunity here for Thailand, and other countries could be watching what you've done and the successes that you've had. Okay, so for me, it's just a quick one. So, I mean, actually, if you uh, look at this event with so many people and, and regulators try to put things together, I think it's, it's super awesome. So, I mean, in terms of startup, it really things that can push the, the whole economy up, I think. Imagine we have like 3 million SMEs, right? You call them SMEs. If we can turn them to be startups and do you t teach them how to do the, like a repeatable and scalable business model and give them access to, to all this uh, equity crowdfunding or even reward crowdfunding or 
angel network or VC networks, that's gonna turn the whole digital economy things up a lot, right? And, and look at in the example in Southeast Asia, for example, we see the company like Tokopedia, right, who just raised like 100 million in, in Indonesia, or Grab Taxi. Grab Taxi that operate in Thailand is actually uh, registered in Malaysia. They just raised like almost 380 million in the past 12 months. So, so that's really creating an e economy, the, the, the startup economy in this country. So, so when you look back in, in Thailand, we, we really, really need something like this as an example to, to compete in the, in the ASEAN region. So, so we are coming to the right way, I think. Yeah, so I'd just like to add that you really have to foster an equity culture and you have to create an environment that allows equity capital to, to form. As you mentioned, you know, for startups, they can't raise debt, and to really to create uh, a, a startup and innovative uh, environment, you have to have an equity culture. This is part of the discussion they're having in Europe right now, which they really don't have an equity culture. I think you're in a, a unique time and place here in Asia, and specifically in Thailand, where you have regulators that are willing to embrace this, this new form of finance, and you have this, this budding startup scene. You know, so now is your time to bring it all together and, and create something really cool and, and awesome. Just one thing to the regulators, I guess, is to say that, as Carl mentioned earlier, when uh, equity crowdfunding to accredited investors began in the U.S. about 18 months ago, it wasn't like they flipped a switch and people were running to their to the websites to begin buying stock as fast as they could in every imaginable issue. Uh, it, it started out very slowly, with crowdfunding platforms to accredited investors who have half a six or 10 or 15 or 20 issues. And those have grown over time. So that marketplace has grown over time. And I think that the marketplace for retail investors will also take time to grow. I don't think retail investors are going to run to every equity crowdfunding platform right away like it's K-pop ticket concerts, concert tickets, right? It's like it's going to be in a much more rational fashion because this is not buying a ticket, this is actually making an investment decision. And I think most people tend to make those decisions most of the time rationally. And so I just think that, that you can move forward and not worry that on day two of the market being open that there will be billions of bot that have been invested. This market will take time to form, but moving forward now is what will position Thailand effectively as ASEAN moves forward. Thank you very much. So um, crowdfunding is something that is certainly, certainly very exciting. It's in development. Um, the, the applications of the whole platform are the various facets of the you know, iterations of, of, of the platform as it moves ahead. Um, it's certainly the implications are very wide ranging. Um, and uh, uh, the take home message here, I think, is for or the relevant parts of the Thai society to come together um, to make this work. Otherwise, uh, we could well be, be left behind yet again. Um, all right, so um, with that, I just want to thank uh, um, Jason, Andrew, Kun Mo, and Carl for this very engaging um, talk and panel session. So thank you very much. <laughs>